Welcome to today's session on forensic considerations for cloud data storage. Um, so who's this for? Who's this, who's this presentation for? And uh, I wanted to introduce it with uh, some expectations here. So um, generally, we're going to talk, obviously, about some cloud services. Um, so I'm hoping that most folks have at least some basic understanding of um, cloud usage. You know the basic terminology, but maybe you've got some limited usage. I, I'm aiming kind of middle ground there. So if you're brand new to, to cloud, there's definitely going to be some terms thrown around that you may not recognize. So keep Google handy. Um, or if you're well experienced in using cloud, hopefully you still learn something uh, from this today. So I kind of tried to balance it out a little bit. But uh, what are we going to look at? Um, cloud storage options, uh, we're going to focus on AWS and Azure for this presentation. Uh, I know obviously there's a lot of other ones, Google, Oracle, um, and, and, and plenty of other, nothing against them. I just spend most of my time in AWS and Azure. So that's that, that's where we're going to we're going to focus our efforts. There's plenty enough to, to talk about for those two alone. Um, we're going to first talk about how to use it securely. Um, and when I'm talking about use it, we're going to we're going to talk about using it as a as a piece of our toolkit, but also how to collect it as from an evidence standpoint. There's there's kind of two pieces to this that we're we're going to dive into. Um, so using it securely is going to be important, but also how to collect it while maintaining the integrity of our evidence, just like we normally do with with any sort of evidence that we that we deal with. And, and that's going to be a reoccurring theme throughout is is really managing our um our evidence in in, in, in the correct way and the way we know very well and is well well established uh, for for many years. So let me click a slide here. Who am I? Uh, my name is Jamie McQuaid. I'm a technical forensics consultant for Magnet. I've been here for for just about eight years now. And uh, um, I've been around DFIR long enough to to see many technology transformations. I know that makes me feel really old and, and whatnot, and I'm sure many of you have as well. I, you know, the big ones come to mind is um, volatile data like memory um, um, and mobile devices. Obviously, acquiring those uh, come with additional challenges. A lot of it's live data um, and, and stuff like that, constantly changing. We're not we're not only dealing with hard drives and dead box forensics these days. There's there's plenty of other avenues that we need to deal with when dealing with evidence. Um, and cloud's another piece to that. It's it's another transformation in technology that we need to recognize, right? And it's and it's important to evaluate any technology for its value, right? You don't want to overemphasize it, but you can't ignore it either, right? As examiners, it's our job to go where the evidence is, whether it's on a person's computer, their phone, in the cloud, wherever it is. If the evidence is there, we need to understand it well enough to um, speak to it and 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 collect it and, and analyze it the way it should be handled properly. So, so that's really what the, the focus is going to be here. And uh, really that's, that's what uh, we're gonna center around. So a brief agenda. Uh, of what we're going to talk about, and I hinted to a little bit already is um, first off, we're going to, we're going to talk about cloud as evidence storage. So adding it to your toolkit. Right, the cloud is just another computer that you can use to 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 keep your evidence. Now, a lot of people they do everything on uh, on prem, off network, air gapped, all of that. Um, some other organizations and teams don't. There's there's different ways to handle different things of evidence, different um, considerations that you need to have. So, cloud as an evidence storage may be accessible or usable for you. It may not. It may be eventually down the road as well. So, there's there's definitely some considerations you're going to have to make as well. Personally, it's it's something I use quite a bit and and it's certainly something that uh, adds value to my um, analysis and my uh, my capabilities, right? So we're going to talk about why you would use cloud as evidence storage. We're going to obviously talk about security considerations because usually that's the biggest flag that people come up with, like oh it's not secure, I can't I can't use it. So we'll we'll talk about those and see how those um, can affect your investigations and your the way you store evidence or use the cloud. Um, and like I said, we're going to talk about using AWS and Azure. I'm kind of going to flip back and forth uh, between the two and, and show parallels. It's really neat to, to the hardest part about learning cloud is, especially if you're using multiple cloud uh, technologies or, or providers, is really just trying to understand what the equivalent is on the other provider is like okay azure calls it this what does aws call it uh it's it's actually really the one of the harder parts of of learning things with cloud um microsoft's got a really good document to to compare that but but again um it's it, there's many parallels and they each have their own value too so sometimes 
AWS may be a better option for a particular feature, and well, Azure may be better for something else, right? Uh, utilize what's what's available to you and and to what works best. Just like you know, in forensics, you have a toolkit. Use the best tool for the job. But then we're going to flip on the the opposite side and say, okay. We may use it as a part of our toolkit, but we may use cloud storage as part of our evidence as well. We may come across and say, hey, we've got to do a cloud collection here and collect some of this data, right? And there's lots of cloud storage evidence locations. You know, we, we support a lot in Axiom, but there's just, there's plenty out there. I'm going to focus on um, the platform-based ones with AWS and Azure, and we're going to talk about the sources within those. Obviously, we can expand that to many other services, Dropbox, Box.com, even Microsoft 365 I'm not going to get into here, but there's still another source of evidence with that. Um, so we're going to talk about those sources. We're going to talk about considerations during your acquisition of what you may want to um, evaluate and, and use when you're doing them. And like I said, again, back to AWS and Azure. Um, and then we're going to go into some examples. I'm going to show you what, what some of these examples are. You can collect them in many different ways. I'm just going to give a few um, tidbits and, and, and ways that I collect some of this data. So let's dive right in. The types of cloud storage. Um, obviously, um, there's lots of different ways you, you can use cloud storage or, or, or use store, any sort of storage mechanisms. The two we're going to focus on here is object storage and compute storage. Um, object storage, usually when people think about cloud, the first thing they think of is, is um, object storage. Usually that's uh, S3 for AWS or a container blob service in, in Azure where you're, you're storing files or, or just your images, your case data, whatever you want to do from a from an evidence standpoint or from an investigative standpoint, you would use object storage for that. But then you can go a step further with uh, compute storage. And obviously, you know, people usually talk about like, oh, I'm going to collect an EC2 instance from, from AWS and everything. Well, you're not collecting an AC, EC2 instance, you're collecting the storage volume to it. It's just like, you're not going to collect my laptop you're going to collect the hard drive in my laptop and analyze that, right? Nobody really cares about the screen or the, I guess maybe the printer, but whatever. Um, you're, you're not worrying about that. So we're going to talk about the compute storage specifically. EBS volumes and AWS disk or attached storage in, uh, in Azure, uh, obviously the big, uh, the big pieces there. And that's where the bulk of ours are. But there are other areas that you can consider storage. There's a lot of um, data lake processing um, options, but also databases. Um, yeah, you could run a database on an instance where uh, it's included in the compute storage, but most uh, both AWS and Azure um, offer services that um, manage that for you. They're already managed and they just give you the database to, to manage it. So again, depending on your investigation, that may or may not apply. We're not gonna get into that too much here, but there's plenty of other um, uh, sources as well. Containers, obviously another one, um, if you're using or investigating those, um, they may be uh, at a different location, different place that you may want to consider. And then logs will come into play uh, in a few places as well. Um, we're going to get into that more on the um, uh, later on. So, but uh, we're, we, I figured I'd start here and we can uh, continue on with the logs uh, after, but it's, it's going to be vital for, for tracking activity in the cloud. So, Cloud is evidence storage. The first question is going to be, well, why would you do it? Why would you use cloud as opposed to an on-prem lab or, or data center? Well, the reasons may vary for, for each organization. For me, the first big one is unlimited storage potential. I'm sure most of you have probably hit a case where you ran out of storage somewhere and you're, you kind of hit, hit a roadblock and you said, okay, we got to go buy five more drives to, to get this going because we don't have enough space to, to manage it. You always have that one case that just balloons to, to, to a huge amount of storage. Well, with the cloud, you could technically never run out of space again. Well, assuming that you can pay for it and afford it, um, they're, they're always going to have that capabilities. But um, again, it's it, it will be important um, to, to keep that. Processing options. Lots of different processing options, both on types of, of uh, platforms to run, Windows, Linux, Mac, you can run um, processing on that. So all the tools you can imagine, right? I'm, I'm a big Windows, Linux person. I use Windows and Linux quite a bit uh, for my investigations, but um, I don't use Mac a lot, but I could certainly use it sometimes. That, that can be very um, helpful in my test scenarios. I'm like, oh, I got to reproduce this, but I don't want to buy a MacBook just to, to do this. Well, I could spin up an instance, spend two hours on it, and get what I need. Um, that can be really helpful um, and adds to the cost savings for, for a lot of the, the hardware and storage costs that, uh, that we come across. Um, and then speed. I got to 
decently fast computer here. I use it. Uh, yeah, I've got another faster one that I do some heavier processing on. Um, great. But that stuff gets old fast and sometimes you can't keep up and you want something faster. Guess what? You can just pay for it and a click of the button, you've got faster processing, you've got more memory, you've got all of those things. Again, it comes at a cost, but if you were if you're a consultant working with a client and said they need it now, well, they're willing to pay a premium for it, then that's that's certainly to it. So um, that's that's also important. Sharing with external stakeholders. Um, that's a big one for me. It's, uh, you know, I, uh, the days of DVDs, USB sticks, all of that, I just, I hate it. Um, so sharing stuff securely with your stakeholders is, is also uh, very valuable in, in terms of um, cloud storage. Uh, and then also, cost savings. I, like I said, further up, there's certainly things that can cost a fair bit using cloud. But if you use it in a smart way, you can save a lot of money uh, in terms of hardware costs, storage costs, um, because a lot of what you're doing can be temporary or it can be permanent. Maybe you've got something you need to run constantly 24 seven, whatever, great. But if you don't, you can instantly spin something up and then tear it down for the exact amount of time you need to use it. And you're not paying for that time in between, that idle time of your computer just sitting there in the lab, right? So you're, you're paying probably a little bit more of a premium um, per, per case, but, but you're not killing time or, or wasting investment in, in that time in between. So the fact that it can be so temporary is actually the biggest part of the cost savings. So, Let's start with security, because that's going to be the biggest question for most uh, most people is how do we demonstrate the integrity of all evidence? So how do we do that today? How do we demonstrate the integrity of our evidence today? If we ignore cloud for a second, how do we do that? If you go back far enough in your forensics 101 training, usually there's the two biggest controls on that is we limit access and we control access to it. And we use a chain of custody to to track who's touched things. So we limit access to it using evidence vaults or, or um, lock up things in, into a, uh, a specific room or, or have control over it. Um, and then we use chain of custody forms. Uh, you know, I still use them to this day that um, you use chain of custody forms to track that evidence. Well, that's just access controls and auditing your access. We can do that with computers very well. And we can also do it with cloud. All the cloud providers provide really um, helpful access controls, helpful is a loaded word there, um, access controls and audit access. So um, you can control who can access, what they can access, what they can do with the data they, they access. Maybe can they read it? They, can they write it? Can they delete it? Can they, whatever, you can control to whatever degree you want. That allows um, uh, some very good granularity that we'll get into for some of these sources. Um, and then how do you, how do we prove that your access controls work. How do you prove that like, okay, you set these up, but how do you know they're working? Well, you can use your audits controls and access controls to audit who accessed them, right? That's your chain of custody. It's the same parallel there, just on a different level, right? So, so not only do you want to try, um, control that access, but you can audit and prove that access too. So let's talk about um, AWS first. Storing evidence in AWS, like I said, we're going to focus on object and compute storage. Um, the first one for object storage, we're going to talk about S3 buckets. Um, and this is where you're going to, you know, from, from storing evidence standpoint, you're going to store your evidence in EO1s, AFF4s, your forensic images, or it could be just files. It could be zips. It could be just files. But you can store that data in the S3 just like you would on a, a network share on your, your local um, machine or, or I guess on your, your lo in your lab or on your local machine as, as just a, a storage drive. Same concept applies. You can also archive it. Again, if you need have requirements to keep your case data for several, several years, that can get very expensive, even on-prem. So finding a good, cheap way to do that archive-wise can be really important. Same thing goes with computing um, storage. Well, you probably want to process this data at some capacity, whether it's local or in the cloud, will depend on your situation, but um, you can certainly util utilize that um, those computing capacity and like I said, the benefits of it, obviously, I, I mentioned earlier, um, and you can run your active case as well in the cloud and then bring it back. So, so again, it will it will vary um, quite a bit. The nice thing about uh, S3 and, and a lot of the storage boxes, is it offers durability and high availability. So you can, with S3 and the computing storage, you can actually um, 
have that secured so that, you know, well, if your drive died at, in the lab, you've got to have those considerations. A lot of that's built into the, the cloud providers as well. So that could be really helpful. So let's start with access controls in AWS. And I could probably do a whole talk just on this. I could actually I'll probably do a whole talk on every single one of these slides. So we're getting at it a little high level, but I wanted to introduce a lot of these topics first. So the first way you manage access controls in AWS is through IAM. Um, it's basically where you control the users, groups, roles, policies, and stuff for individual users or services. Um, you know, most people know what a user group or a role is. Uh, the, the, it, it's really you apply policies to either one, either of those or any of those, and it says what the user or uh, service um, or role can or cannot do. Um, so what we uh, they have is AWS uh, manage um, policies, they, and they have customer managed policies as well as inline. But um, focusing on the first two for a second, um, AWS managed policies they have lists of policies that you can allow or deny any given thing for a hundred different situations, more than a hundred, but um, lots of different situations. AWS has a list of, of policies that you can utilize, and they're predefined and, and work really well. But if you want to get more granular with it and define your own policies for specific things customer managed ones work quite well and you can define that set those up um i've got uh just an example of the um uh, i am policy there for amazon's uh managed policy for s3 read only access and that's it's a json it, it generally looks like that it basically allows you read only access so you can get or list the s3 data but you can't write to it or delete or anything like that that's a very simple policy um inline policies don't get into it too much but but really those are specific to an individual user and you want to target it for say jamie needs this policy in this sense you're not going to build it so that everybody can use it it might have something referenced specifically for me you would then use an inline policy for that now we were talking about the users and the services and, and, and stuff, but you can also use bucket policy. So when you go into S3, you create a folder or what's called a bucket. You can set up policies specifically in those and you can say, okay, everybody has access to this bucket, but only these three people have access to this one. So everyone who has access to the account can access the one, but not the other one you may control access to it so it basically does it on a on a higher level per bucket and you can and it's structured in json very similarly to the im policies but um, you can control access that way um, against people um, in, within your own account then the other one is bucket acls or access control lists now these are a little bit older um, not used quite as much anymore but what they do help for is if you're trying to get a little more granular within a bucket bucket policy is applied to the entire bucket but you may have files or objects within that bucket that you want to control access to um, you can do that with acls a little bit better it allows more granular control uh, at a per object basis um, which which can be helpful and then the last one i'm going to mention here is pre-signed urls Okay, we talked about stakeholders and sharing data securely with stakeholders. Well, we don't, we're not going to give them an, uh, an AWS account and say, go into my AWS account, here's your, your login, and, and go in that way. You could, but you probably don't need to for all your stakeholders. Well, what if you could just securely give them a URL that's time sensitive and controlled to specifically for them, you could set up pre-signed URLs to share private objects with other folks uh, temporarily. Um, you can generate these by the CLI or the SDK. We'll, we'll talk a bit more about this, show some examples later on, but you can actually apply these and, and send this URL to say your stakeholder and say, hey, here's your, your report, click on it. It's good for the next 24 hours. That thing will die and nobody will have access to it again, um, but it's specific to you. So it can be really helpful for, for sharing sharing um, data externally for folks that aren't part of your organization or anything like that. So what about encryption? We, we talked about access controls already, and I, I probably some of you have been like, well, we should have talked about encryption first. Well, yeah, I kind of debated back and forth. Should we talk about encryption or access controls? Encryption fit well here because I, I wanted to uh, introduce it here. And um, obviously, you're going to want to encrypt your data while on the cloud. And there's lots of options to do that. Some uh, the, the encryption is solid for both AWS and Azure is, is very good. They have their own um, self-managed um, uh, or, or, or AWS managed um, encryption options for S3 and EBS. You see further down there, um, they, they allow you to audit just by the click of a button, you can turn on encryption for both S3 buckets or EBS volumes. Um, the default is off for both of them, but you it, again, it's literally a kick, click of the button. You can see in the screenshot there, the default AWS slash EBS, that's to turn on the basic um, 
um, AWS managed. Now, technically, they control the keys, so they could decrypt it. They they have their own processes around that their, your data is secured, but you, maybe you need to take that extra step. Now, I'll use the default AWS managed stuff for my day-to-day -day activities in the cloud, but if I'm dealing with evidence, I'm probably going to use something a little bit more secured um, using either KMS here, um, where I'm going to use my own customer managed key. Um, in those situations, I can import my own key material to use my own and, and, and actually allow myself to, to manage it. Now, AWS is not going to help you if you lose that key. So it's really important for you to recognize the importance of setting it up this way and then being uh, cognizant of the, the the risks that are involved with it. So um, you can even go as far as using um, Cloud HSM, which is hardware backed. So you can actually um, use hardware backed keys. And that may be a requirement if you're in FIPS environment or something like that, that you actually have to use a, a certain level of uh, FIPS 140, uh, I believe dot two or three, um, but um, the cloud HMSM will, will satisfy that um, and uh, allow you to, to do that hardware back key management. Um, so there's lots of different encryption capabilities or options that uh, that we can get into here even um, I, I we didn't we're not talking a ton about EFS but EFS is just like a network share um, for file system um, you can use cloud client side encryption too so if you're on the box you set up BitLocker on that box it's got nothing to do with the cloud you're setting it up in that um, system and you can you can you control that yourself right so that's outside the scope of AWS they have no visibility to that and you would you would manage that yourself as well so client side is also an option to that so now, what about audit access? You need to be able to um, prove that you, you did what you said you did. So um, the big one for AWS is CloudTrail. Um, CloudTrail will audit all access um, via that, that is called via the, uh, the API, which is either through the console, com command line, or the STK. So it's basically anybody accessing anything in AWS, um, it gets logged in CloudTrail. The last 90 days get uh, dumped into CloudTrail as a service, and you can download the, either the JSON or the CSV. Older stuff you can set to save to an S3 bucket, which again is going to be helpful because we're going to use S we use S3 buckets already. Um, and you can save that indefinitely. You may want to save that forever, um, or at least six, seven years, depending on retention policies and whatnot. And that's uh, a GZIP JSON. Um, now, if you want to analyze this stuff, again, last 90 days is easy. I would in, in the console is pretty easy quickly to, uh, to do a quick audit on things. And we'll show that in a little bit. Um, and then in the cloud, you use the console, or if it's in S3 bucket, um, Athena is a good service. Um, even if you're not great with SQL, it uses SQL queries to query that uh, that JSON, GZIP stuff in S3 um, for to go through a, like an entire organization's worth. It gets messy, but um, again, even if you're not that great with SQL, it's a uh, it's a good way to to do so. Maybe you want to download those. Maybe you, you download that CSV or JSON data and want to um, it, download it to your your own uh, um, infrastructure here. Um, you can use anything to analyze it locally. Uh, Elasticsearch, Kibana. Um, Splunk, Grafana, even Axiom. Um, I know some other folks are, are chatting a little bit about that uh, in other talks uh, that you can ingest some of that stuff right into Axiom. So that can be very helpful. Um, and then there's other types of logs. You know, we're just talking about AWS access, but you may want um, application log access. So um, specific applications that you're that are being used in your um, uh, in your infrastructure. You could use CloudWatch to do that. Custom scripts. We won't get into that too much. But one thing I wanted to call out that may not be visible or may not people may not recognize is um the one thing that uh, CloudWatch and, and the application logs don't track is your EC2 instance access. So somebody um, SSHing or, or RDPing into your computing resources, um, that doesn't get picked up because you're just, it's network activity or um, it, it's activity just to the actual host OS. Guess what? We know how to do that. We're, we're examiners. We know how to analyze event logs and unified logs and syslog, depending on the OS. We can look at that access and access controls, and you can look for Windows events of login and log out activity and stuff like that. Um, that's your standard forensic stuff. So that still doesn't go away when you're dealing with some of these auditing sources. You still just want to consider that, hey, all of this stuff is going to be here. All of the on OS type stuff is still going to be on those systems, and we 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 want to collect those and analyze those uh, as as well, depending on the case. 
So let's flip over to Azure here and talk a little bit about the same things here. So um, let's real quick and go into um, the same type of parallel stuff about storing evidence in Azure. We're going to talk about object storage and computing storage again, just like we did with AWS. Um, they're called a little different things. There's different features involved with some of them. So I'll call some of those out as I go through it. Um, object storage, uh, generally we, we refer to that as blob storage. Again, same idea. You're dealing with files, images, stuff like that. That's where I store a lot of my images um, in terms of um, uh, keeping a, a large list. I can only have so many hard drives and, and, and stuff uh, available to me. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty good collection, I guess. Um, but um, same sort of concepts apply where you're, you're doing with object storage and then computing as well. You're going to want to do some processing. You can use VMs and uh, the disks associated to those. So how do how does access controls look in Azure? Um, Luckily, if any of you are familiar with uh, using Windows Active Directory, this is very familiar to you. Azure Active Directory is very similar setup. If you're not, and it's kind of net new, um, you're still dealing with users, groups, roles, same sort of thing. Um, you can set up access policies and, and that, and it's and it's it's very easy to follow. Um, but again, the nice thing is if you are familiar with Active Directory, which has been around for forever, um, this will be a, a somewhat familiar transition for you. Um, one thing I wanted to call out here um, at the bottom is shared access signatures. And we'll, we'll show it off here in a little bit. But the, the really nice thing, it's very similar to the pre-signed URLs with, uh, with AWS. Um, this allows you to create a URL, a secure URL, temporarily giving access to, to uh, an object or, or an asset uh, for someone in in your um, uh, outside of your organization, so you don't have to give them poor, uh, AW, uh, Azure access. You let them log in, uh, and you give them a, or you give them a URL, and they can directly access it for a short period of time. So I'll, I'll show that. And you, the nice thing with uh, I really like about the at the Azure ones is you can restrict it by IP address. So I can say, hey, give me your organization's IP address, and we'll lock it down to just that. Or give me your IP address, and we, we can lock it down just this. Only you can access this, and you can control it by the um, uh, the IP addresses as well as all the other time and, and other limitations. So that can be really helpful. So what about encryption? We talked about encryption for AWS. For Azure, very similar. They have a key vault that allows you to store, generate keys, secrets, certif certif certificates, sorry, um, and allows you to um, manage those um, in one spot uh, across your, your account. Um, and again, by default, they have a lot of uh, encryption turned on all already. Um, both um, both the um, blob storage and the VM disk are encrypted by default, but they're using the platform managed keys, which is good for a lot of my data. I just, yep, that's good. That, that's how I do it. But you may want to use the key vault and use a customer managed keys um, in the same way for any of your evidence because you may have uh, stricter controls or, or may want to uh, consider that for it. Um, so you, that option is very easy to drop down set up the keys uh, and then select whatever ones you want to use for it. But it, encryption is on by default for most of the, for both of those Azure resources. Um, if you want the additional um, steps, using Key Vault is, is definitely the way to go for that. Uh, another note is data in transit. Um, by default, it's encrypted and will deny uh, HTTP traffic. So that's that's important to um, recognize that it is going to be encrypted by default, and and you can set you can allow HTTP traffic if you want, but the default is having it on. So maybe you should just keep the uh, HTTPS um, set up, and, and, and away you go. Um, it just it's it's a better default to have. So I, I applaud that and, and suggest it, and, and unless there's a very rare situation where you don't want encrypted traffic. Um, Another one that's actually kind of neat is you can set it to prioritize routing over the Azure network. So instead of um, finding an entry point um, wherever, as soon as it gets to your um, your storage or, or account or anything like that, you can it, it can find the local the closest access point um, to the Azure network for whoever is accessing that data and enter there and traverse across the Azure network, um, it, making it just a little bit more secure. Yeah, you're still encrypted, but the less stuff that goes over the internet, now well, you're obviously trusting Microsoft to, to do that as well, but I'd rather might trust Microsoft over it than say, um, you know, just the, the general 1200 ISPs that it has to travel through or, or whatever along the way. You know what I mean, right? It's uh, it prioritizing routing over the Azure network as opposed to the public internet. Um, it's just an extra layer to me, um, which, which I also like. 
So how do we audit access in Azure? And lots of different ways to do that as well. Here is, is logs. Again, logs all day, uh, every day. Um, they have the activity log, um, which uh, allows you to track subscription activities, you can export that into um, a CSV, just like we did with the CloudTrail and AWS, um, and you can dump that uh, subscription level activities out uh, very easily. But it gets really complicated if you start doing that on a single re individual resource, the access logs and, and stuff, you, you know, you can look at individual ones, but if you want to track that across a lot of different resources, different accounts and stuff, you probably want to start using log analytics via um, Azure Monitor. Um, really nice way to consolidate your logs um, and do your analysis that way. You just need to enable it through the diagnostic settings and it'll start feeding it through um, to your workspaces and, and, and you can do plenty of analysis within the cloud or you can dump any of that stuff out um, just like uh, we, we had talked about earlier. So. Um, you can also use log analytics for application logs. It, it's not on by default, but you can configure an agent to um, say maybe you log your application, your web application log stuff to a text file. Um, you can have the, the agent pick that text file up, read it um, with, a, with a little bit of work, and then it gets pulled into the rest of your logs um, as well. That works quite well. And then the same thing goes with our um, VM access. When you're accessing it through RDP or SSH, uh, your Windows or Linux boxes, um, you're going to still want to audit that access and and take a look at it so so be aware of of, of those uh, those limitations to it as well okay so now that we've talked about using cloud as a storage mechanism in our forensic toolkit right as as something we would use to expand our toolkit um what about evaluating it as evidence this might be actually come up before you end up using it as a cloud storage. So I don't know which one's going to come first for you, but being aware of it either way is going to be helpful in understanding um, your, uh, your investigation to it. So um, we're going to talk now about cloud storage as evidence. And guess what? All of the things we just talked about still apply. If you know, we, we, they also apply the same way. If you're collecting evidence from any of these sources, they're the same things you're just using them in a different way you're using them as part of your toolkit if you're using cloud storage or if you're investigating them the same protections the same same rules apply i threw in logs there because now we're going to get into actually uh, a little bit more detail to it but um it's important to recognize that yes a lot of the object storage compute storage databases containers images are also you know nothing changes it's just your purpose for them changes you may deal with them in a different way, but they're still going to have those same rules uh, around auditing access or, or access controls, and uh, and that can be very helpful. So some initial considerations here, um, you know, how you collect it is going to vary for each case or even your your organization. Um, and these are kind of considerations I take to whether I want to analyze it in the cloud or bring it back local or, or whatever I, I do in between. Um, is your analysis being done in the cloud or local? That's that's an important thing uh, to, to consider, right? Or even further after that, even if you do bring it local or it is local, are you going to be stored in the cloud afterwards? Um, you know, it's not going to no point in copying it local as a cloud data if you're just going to push it back up to the cloud after you're done it's just going to cost you more money right um it, it does it does get pricey moving things in and out of the cloud generally um you get cheaper preference if you keep data in the cloud so if it's in the cloud analyze it in the cloud if by that's a general guideline for me um if it's in the cloud analyze it in the cloud if especially if it's going to be stored in the cloud afterwards um if not you know you may want to bring analysis back in but don't if you bring it back into the cloud again you're you're adding costs every time you move stuff um, generally uploading stuff to the cloud isn't costing too much um, but bringing it out of the cloud does and it may actually be cheaper given that we deal with large amounts of data it may actually be cheaper to spin up an, a, an instance or a vm to do your analysis in the cloud than it would be to download it and then push it back up it actually running that processing in the cloud may actually be your cheaper option in a lot of those situations so uh, again it's a consideration you're going to have to make in your own investigations and in your own processes but both are viable options and i actually go back and forth with it. Sometimes I want something local, some things I'll, I'll want to analyze in the cloud and it never needs to leave the cloud because it's it's going to be stored up there as well. So it, it does vary. 
one thing to note, if you're dealing with intrusions or malware cases, I, this is an obvious thing, but um, if the account you're looking at is compromised, not just the instance, um, but the risk of like maybe there's um, access keys on the instance or something like that, um, if the account or there's risk of the account being compromised, you probably want to not just um, isolate the, the instance, but you might want to actually move the data off of that account um, until you're sure, right? So make sure you have the capability to move something to a trusted account um, if that's a, a necessary part of your uh, uh, your investigation. Not all cases need that, but, but definitely for malware intrusion type investigations, um, that's something you should consider as regular part of your process. Um, and another note about forensic containers, and I'm talking about like stuff like EO1s, AFF4s, images, stuff like that. We, we're, we're used to dealing these um, uh, uh, regularly. You know, you're going to have your, I, I want to say physical disks, but they're not physical disks. You're getting a, a, a physical of the partition or the, it's, it's really illogical of that. You're not accessing the physical disk most of the time, but you can get, grab, like I said, the, the EBS VM disks, and you can do an EO1 image, an AFF4 image of those, um, or you may be getting for probably for the most part is logical containers. And that's what we deal with uh, quite a bit when you're dealing with um, other, other um, sources. These could just be files, right? They could be just a log, right? A, a bunch of our cloud trail logs or or anything like that they could just be files or pieces of, of data um, you're dealing with like lo1 um, containers aff4l even zip zips a container it, it main, keeps our data enclosed um, the key thing here is uh, the key point on on containers is us as examiners need to recognize that a lot of what we're doing in the cloud and in, in collections you're pulling stuff via an api and you need to recognize that you're not accessing stuff at the disk level. You know, this isn't an NTFS volume that you're grabbing, you know, the MFT and, and going at it just like you traditionally would on a physical hard drive. So recognizing the separation of those things is really important to know what to expect and what's, what's working and what's not. So, so th that's what I wanted to kind of just touch on here just a little bit. And this applies to any collection, but especially for cloud collections um, is... You're pulling those individual files, logs, whatever it is, into a container. You know, you could be creating that container yourself. Your tool may be creating that container. Um, the more common ones would be yeah, grabbing S3 data or blob data from those object storage um, or, or other services like Dropbox, Box.com, Google Drive, whatever. Those, those are just files that people have, and they get stored that way. Each one of those are pulled via APIs. And Every API is different. Uh, you know, when, when, when companies or like Dropbox's API and Boxes and Azure's and AWS's, those, they, they have APIs to access that data, but they're all built differently and they give you access to different things. They store the data differently and they access it uh, differently. And you're at the um, limitation of that API or that the mercy of that API of what you can do. Um, three main uh, API ways you can, you can use APIs, ways you can use APIs, public APIs, private APIs and scraping. Public ones, um, you'll typically see um, well-documented, you know, AWS, Azure, not generally have a very public uh, API that uh, allows you to do certain things with their SDKs or um, CLI and, and, and allow you to pull that data. And it's well-documented. But there's also other utilities and tools that have private APIs. Um, that is a little harder to, to uncover unless you're a partner with them um, and they provide you that. Um, they're not going to detail every single piece to it. So it's kind of a little bit of reverse engineering to try to figure out how those private APIs work. And it's not a one to one because you don't work for that company, right? So it's it's good to recognize uh, when you're using public versus private APIs and, and what the limitations are. And then what if the, the service and that doesn't give you access at all? Well, okay, the only other option is really just loading up on a web page and scraping that data down, um, which is which is works in many situations, but um, it's not ideal, right? But there's pros and cons to each one of those. And um, it's really um, important to recognize that this isn't file system level access. It's a service that lets you pull files and you, you, you're gonna have limitations to that. Timestamps are the big one. And uh, that's, that's probably the one, what I wanted to get at here was um, some allow the original timestamps, 
when they store the data, some don't. Some blow half that away and just say, okay, well, here it is. This is when it was uploaded. You know, they they don't have Mac times and they're not well as defined as you know NTFS or FAT32 or anything like that. They're they're defined how they define them. They they may have a, a last modified time up there, but do you know if that last modified time means the same thing as it did when um that uh, you know when was it last modified when it was in the cloud or last modified when it was like, it, the transferring between volumes gets well documented you know everyone's got those sans posters of like okay you move file between the volumes the created time gets updated and everything well that's that's also a thing in the cloud you need to recognize so sometimes they'll allow the original timestamps other services don't it varies between the services so you got to recognize when you're pulling from different services what those limitations are um sometimes they'll be blank you may you pull it down and there's no created time there um okay well they don't have it right um other times it's the api limits it and you can't get it now it, they could have um, if the API overwrites the time during collection, the only option sometimes is to make note of it when it was on in the cloud service and then either note it in your, your, your notes or logs um, or stop the file, which is usually frowned upon in, in a lot of situations. Um, but that's, you know, the, the timestamp's not wrong, but the API is limited in that fact that it doesn't actually give you access to that that information there's nothing wrong with it it's just how that api is designed and that's a limitation of your the way you're collecting that data you know i guess you could go to uh, amazon or, or dropbox and say okay i need to forensically image this hard drive mail it to me um then you were back to our original thing but that's not a viable option for most situations so we were at the mercy of some of those apis right um it's really uh important to to recognize that and as we go through here so Let's look at some ways and do some examples here and talk about accessing AWS and Azure uh, methods. You know, I've talked about these already, but the main ways to access um, both AWS and Azure data is through the console or the portal, through the web page, basically. Um, we're going to talk about CloudTrail and Blob um, SAS data, um, acquisitions there, CLI, we're going to do S3 there, the SDK. Um, that's just your tools. Um, Axiom uses the SDK for a lot of things as well. So we're going to show Axiom um, using the SDK to pull um, EBS and S3 data as well. There's pros and cons to each of them. So let's take a look. Collecting S3. So many of these worth it like i can collect s3 a million different ways i'm picking cli for this example just because it's a it's a fun example it requires access keys um, to set up i already have those set up so what i'm going to do is i'm going to flip over to my command line here uh if i can find the right one oh that's really ugly but we'll uh we'll open up a new one there we go um one of my other windows timed out okay so what we're going to do here is um, we're going to do AWS uh, S3 search. So most of the uh, CLI for AWS is just I've already got it installed. I've already got um, my access keys set up for my account. So I can use AWS command and uh, S3 is the service we're going to look at and LS. That's just if you know Linux, you've used LS a million times before, but it's just going to list all the buckets that I have in my account. OK, that's pretty simple. I got three three buckets in there. Um, we could do AWS S3 LS uh, S3 and take a look at what's in the Recce Connect. Uh, one. There, there's a couple files in there. Cool, not, not, nothing too exciting, but let's say we want to copy um, this data down. We want to collect it. Well, it's as simple as just doing S3 copy and we list our recce connect it does an auto collect i which i always typo it but we'll see and we'll put it to my desktop so we'll go to jay mcquaid desktop and we're going to go recursive lots of options to do this um so just uh, bear in mind that i'm doing some very simple commands here but we run that perfect we just downloaded those five files very easy. Now, if we go back to our slides here and we go back to our slides, that's pretty quick and easy to do, but we just threw those files on my desktop. The Mac time saw it changed, all of that stuff. There's no containers to it. So you got to manage your own setup that way. But if you're just collecting and grabbing files and you don't care about that type of thing, then that's fine. The contents of the files are the same. The hashes will still match, and in, in, in that sense, the metadata is the only thing that's changed there. Um, but again, quick, easy, very great, great way to do it. Um, but there are other ways to do it, which we'll show in in a few seconds. But uh, but again, that's another great way to um, collect data is the CLI. Another example: 
EBS volumes. Let's let's use Axiom for that. Um, and what we're going to do is what it's what it's going to do is it's going to create a snapshot of the uh, EBS volume and then copy it to S3. Um, so let's open up Axiom. I've got Axiom open up here. We're going to go to cloud. We're going to go to AWS, and it's going to ask for my region, access key, and secret key. Um, I hope I still have that open somewhere. Yeah, I do. Good. I never share these with people. You guys are seeing it right now, but after this uh, is done, I am going to go change that because this would give you access to my account. But that's okay. There's enough time in between that you will not see it. Um, going to S3. Well, that looks like the same thing we just looked at. We can go into Recce Connect here and just grab those files if we wanted to. Cool. It's the exact same thing we just did for S3. What about EC2? We can go into the EC2 instance here and go edit. Um, I'll just go view instances. I should have one in there. Yeah, there's just one that I set up just as a test. Uh, it's a small eight gig running instance. It goes into the next stage phase here. We put a decrypt description. Uh, we can put the format VHD, VMDK. Pick a bucket where you want to save it to. Well, hopefully you created a bucket beforehand. Um, you don't want to probably save it to another evidence bucket, but you can save it to that bucket. And then um, just remember, there are costs of moving this data and storing this data. So we can remove it automatically for you. I sometimes uncheck that and uh, and remove it later myself, just in case there was something wrong with the acquisition. I don't like removing it and doing the extra step twice again. Um, but again, totally up to you if uh, on your process. I'm not actually going to do it for this case, just for time's sake. You hit next, it goes. It does the snapshot, like I said, and copies that data over. So uh, lots of good things there. Note, again, encryption. If you're encrypting or you're collecting that data encrypted, you may want to make sure you're capturing the keys, especially if it's customer managed um, type stuff. You want to capture those keys. Otherwise, you'll never be able to decrypt it as well. So um, note about encryption. Uh, again, the nice thing here is you're putting stuff into a container. It's maintaining that forensic process. Um, but you, there are some limitations to collecting via the SDK. And that's not just an Axiom limitation. The SDK has its own limitations as well. Um, you know, one terabyte max there's some timeout capabilities there um, that uh, that you need to be aware of and and that can be um, really important to note so what about azure blob storage well let's dive into the portal and take a look at this we're going to generate a, a, an sas token uh, in url uh, to get te temporary access to something so let me go to my uh power my thing here yeah maybe this one yeah there's the, there's the, the console here but let's go over to azure and i've got a, a storage account here with cases and evidence if i go into evidence there's one picture so if i click on that picture um here's the url to access it if i click on a say copy that and paste that into a new tab not found i can't access it because it's a private storage okay well i want to share this to, with someone how do i do that Generate SAS. This is going to be a shared access signature. Generate it. You can do set up your keys any way you want. You can set up permissions, read, write, whatever. You can set up a time limit. This limit's going to go on for you know just just for a little bit today, a couple hours. I can even allow my own IP address only or, or whoever's IP address. I'm not going to set that, but you can certainly limit it to IP address. And the default is HTTPS. Generate that token. Copy the URL. Let's do the exact same thing we just did. Boom. There's the picture, right? So that's a very easy, quick way to share data for different uh, accounts, and it can be really helpful uh, to share with people external to your organization. That can that can help. Um, it does take more effort to set up. You can you can automate it. You can script it. You can do a lot of that stuff um, uh, through CLI and scripts, but um, it does require a, a little bit more effort than some of the other methods. Okay, what about CloudTrail? Um, accessing CloudTrail, collecting CloudTrail logs. We said this is for auditing purposes. Last 90 days are within CloudTrail. The older stuff's in S3. Let's take a look at that. We'll open up my other window. Let's see. There we go. So we're in CloudTrail. Um, I went to event history here, and I've got some. Um, this is again the night, last 90 days. I'm in my account here. Um, let's go event name and let's say terminate instance. So if I want to track, oh, that's going slow. Terminate instance. There we go. There. There's every time I've terminated an instance in the last uh, month or so. I've terminated a few instances there, and you can get details about that instance. And uh, there's the event record. And that's what it looks like, you know, in, in whether we're um, copying it out and, uh, and storing it uh, in S3 or within CloudTrail. You can download those uh, that event history right here as a CSV or a JSON. So again, copying it local or keeping it in the cloud, your analysis. Either way works quite well. So 
that was a really quick way to kind of go through some of the, um, let me flip back to the slides here. This is a really quick way uh, for the pros and cons is it logs everything. CloudTrail can log everything for anything. So when you're looking at it, it can get very noisy. There's pros and cons to that. And um, it, one thing, like I said before, CloudTrail is good for a API access, but it doesn't include logins to, to your instances or network traffic. Those don't count. You need to look at those elsewhere. So really uh, important to remember that uh, as we go through these things things and, uh, and, and track that. Next up, troubleshooting issues. Uh, this is kind of a joke, but it, it's, it's actually real. Um, you know, just kidding. Like there's, there's many ways you could have issues when you're collecting this data or using it as storage. Um, timeouts, rate limits, service limits, stuff like that coming to get. I guarantee you 90% of the time though, it's probably going to be around um, permissions. Uh, the challenge of troubleshooting uh, is always going to be uh, uh, kind of a double-edged sword is seriously, most of the time it's going to be permissions. If you think of all those times we talked about, you know, securing your data and, and your evidence in the cloud and picture that basically working against you in every possible manner, that's really where you're dealing with it. And, you know, it's great if you're trying to secure your data. It's awful if you're trying to collect your data. So remember that when you get really frustrated and and because uh, you're using some of these controls, either whether you're um, using it to secure your own data or when you're collecting evidence for a case, um, that can be really important to recognize that always check your permissions because um, there's different degrees of it. Like I said, in uh, the access controls for AWS, the IAM access policies, um, the bucket policies, the bucket AC or the bucket ACLs, all those come into, there's organizational controls, service controls, lots of those are permission layer upon layer. And usually the default is just to deny it. Unless you specifically say allow, it's gonna deny you access. And I, personally for me, I'll go through the troubleshooting steps to know that my stuff is going to be um, denied by default, even if I miss something, um, because that's uh, that's going to be my my main focus with it. So um, that's everything I've got. Um, hopefully um, this was helpful for for folks, and uh, we can uh, go through. Feel free to reach out to me. You can ask some questions here on the, the Discord. Um, email me afterwards, Jamie.McQuaid at Magnet Forensics, or my Twitter handle is uh, at RecuTech. Um, feel free to reach out. Um, love to chat about cloud forensics. Any thing cloud or forensics is not just cloud forensics but i'm um, happy to chat about any of this or, or any questions you guys might have so um thanks for watching and uh have a good rest of your day bye-bye